One day in 64 AD, the city of Rome burned. Much of the downtown area set fully ablaze, collapsed. People panicked. Thousands of people fled. Over a million would eventually be displaced from a city of 1.5 million people. And the great persecution of the church finally got underway because of lies, deception, and scapegoating. Christians had not been popular since Christians were a thing. Paul preached the gospel at Galatia, around Antioch, Ephesus, and when the disciples were first called Christians, they were identified as something different from the Jewish religious minority. And of course, they always ran into problems with the Jewish authorities, and increasingly then with Roman authorities. Romans who were busy just wanting to maintain the peace to keep the factions of Judaism from fighting one another or rebelling against Rome, they become increasingly aware of what we are and that we are distinctly different from the Jewish population, and they also begin increasingly to see the dangers of Christianity. To be born a Pharisee or a Sadducee meant to stay with your own and marry your own and to pass on your religion only to your own. You didn't care about what the Romans believed or what Greeks believed or Arabians believed. But Christians were going around and spreading this message of the gospel of Jesus to everyone. Everybody could be potentially converted. Anybody could become a Christian. And the doctrine and teaching of that religion was dangerous. Dangerous because it held such crazy ideas as the emperor was not a god but only human that there was no miraculous investiture of precious metals in the blood of the aristocrats, but that they were only human. That all were equally made in the image of God and beloved by God, but all equal in that love of God. And there is only one God, and all of the fables and myths around which their society had been constructed were then false. That's why the charges that accompany being a Christian usually involve treason. The two main charges were always atheism and treason. We think of atheism as to have no gods at all. For the Romans, atheism was anybody that didn't have all of them as a group. You denied some of the gods, so you were an atheist. Atheism and treason, because Christians couldn't say that the emperor was a god. As this increasingly made everyone in the upper echelons of the government and the aristocracy very nervous with the spread of Christianity, it became convenient to start scapegoating the Christians. If you're the head of the government and bad things happen because of your poor planning, if there's a famine and you weren't prepared, if your infrastructure is crumbling and you blew the money on more mansions for yourself, you might suddenly begin ascribing the bad turn of luck that you're having with the gods being angry and the gods are conveniently usually angry because you're allowing things that you hate. That's to say, when you decide to point your finger at what is causing the problem, it always is conveniently something you were already opposed to. Nero had been stirring this pot for a while. Things are bad in the empire in certain places because we tolerate Christians and Jupiter is unhappy. It's because we have Christians among us that are blaspheming our gods and our altars. The gods are angry and that's why the weather's bad and the crops didn't grow and that's why all these other things. And when the emperor got the brilliant idea to burn down the downtown area so he could replace it with a giant palace structure solely for him to live in and the Roman Senate had the impudence to tell him no, they weren't going to let that happen. Suddenly there's a fire that breaks out. Nobody knows who. And of course, the blame is strictly fixed on the Christians. Nero convinces everyone, or so he tries. The Christians set fire to the eternal city. The Christians set fire to our capital. The Christians set fire. Lies, lies, and more lies. But it's the first openly official, systematic oppression of the Christian faith that had been local and sporadic up until now. To the degree that there was a policy, it was sort of generalized, but Nero specifically gives the instructions to find all the Christians you can, which involved all the usual suspects too. Everybody that he didn't like or rubbed them the wrong way suddenly was accused of being a Christian. 
That's how witch hunts work. And all of these people that are politically inconvenient, I can blame the fire on them. I can use the fire as an excuse to eliminate them. And I still get rid of the downtown area and I get to rebuild it in my image and honor. It's a win-win-win. And so hundreds, at least, probably thousands of Christians die over a period of a few weeks in this great persecution around the city of Rome and the fire. No less than two apostles. Because St. Paul is still there awaiting his second hearing for charges stemming from the Holy Land. And though he's a Roman citizen, they will conveniently strip him of his citizenship in order to be able to cut his head off during the persecution. A criminal, by the way, act, even under their own law. And they will finally get their hands on Peter and crucify him upside down on a hill called Vatican Hill. Perhaps thousands of souls and no less than two apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ perish because of the lies and deceptions of a system that perpetuates itself by lies and deceptions and cannot tolerate the truth. And it really is the capstone on a whole life story of both Peter and Paul. Two men from a similar place, but very different lives that end up the same. Peter being Jewish by ancestry, being a fisherman, being from Galilee, being originally an uneducated man, though we don't know what happened in the interim. He seems to be quite literate in his writings. And Paul, who is a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, who trained up by the most famous rabbi of his generation, Gamaliel. These two men, Jewish, 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 all the way through of the first century in their own areas, and they both end up dying in Rome, bearing witness to the Savior of the world because they have become Christians. Entrusted to them is the confession of faith that uproots them from their home, their land, their people, that alienates them from their families, from their previously, the, the factions of Judaism they were previously a part of. They become completely ostracized from everything they once knew and become hunted men in the world persecuted for the name of Jesus. And they die in the capital of a foreign empire far from home, murdered by people for preaching that same name of Jesus. And everything that happens, everything that our texts this evening are about that point to, the spreading of the gospel, the preaching against heresy and false doctrine, getting rid of the Pharisaic ideas of circumcision and legalism, moving forward to the preaching of the freedom of the gospel, all of this winding up the confession of Peter of who Jesus is that will cause both of them to go to their death. And without any hesitation or chance of doubt, Peter and Paul were convinced that it was all worth it because their value system was different than that of the world. In the world, there is lust for things, for comfort, for possessions. There is lust for long life and fruitfulness filled with all sorts of things. People still today in our society has become trendy to make a bucket list. Things that you want to get done or see before you kick the bucket when really our fate is in the hands of the Lord and what we see or don't see will be in his timing ultimately. But we make plans around things that we're affixed to in the world. If Peter and Paul had done what was good for the world, they would have lived a lot longer perhaps, but they would not have gone to eternal life. They end up living this life completely alien to what they would have expected even in their childhood or their young adulthood. They end up in places they never imagined, doing things they never imagined, and they end up dead in ways they could not have imagined at the beginning. But their value system is different. They no longer are attached to the things of the world. They're no longer attached to the material things. They're no longer attached to earthly power or comforts. Their bucket list is the same every single day to preach the gospel of Jesus, to share the gospel of Jesus with others, others to live the gospel of Jesus in the here and now, in a world that is swirling around the abyss and headed down, in a world that was falling apart already long before their time, Peter and Paul's only ambition was to share the word of God with the world before it fell off the precipice. 
Therefore, they had a full life and completed their mission. They completed their vocation. They did exactly what Paul said in his epistle before his passing. They ran the race, they kept the faith, and they received the crown of the one that ran the race and finished it. They do so by giving their lives all the way to the very end, bearing witness to Jesus, knowing with surety that what they believed and were sharing with others was priceless, eternal, infinite, and beyond all the power, possessions, material comfort, or things of the world that could be had. It was worth dying to receive the reward in heaven. It was worth preaching themselves to death to share the word with the world. And it is precisely this reason they had to die from a Roman pagan perspective. This is what was wrong with them. Their religion did not revolve around the empire. It did not revolve around the emperor. It did not revolve around the material world. They would not give their lives for this empire's expansion and maintenance, but they belonged to a king whose kingdom was not and is not of this world. That made them dangerous because the one thing that the devil can't have is people believing in the gospel and turning their backs on the things of the world that they, he uses to tempt them. And so it really becomes a question of that value system. Who lived a life well lived? In the world, we build monuments to people like Herod the Great, how he's remembered in history. We build monuments to the Caesars and to the emperors, to things that fade away and disappear. The best way to weather our existence in this world is to know that we are citizens of the next, to hold to that doctrine of the apostles, of the Christ who died for us, who rose again, who has delivered us from sin, death, and the devil, and delivers us even unto a new creation. With that confidence, we can bear all the struggling and strife of this world. With that in mind, we can have our head cut off. We can be crucified upside down on the Vatican Hill. Whatever happens, come what may, because the kingdom in which we are living is not of this world. In Jesus' name, amen.